Isn't that amazing? Just that video makes you want to go all the way there. I might be coming, potentially. Don't make false promises, Nadia. Good morning. Guys, we aren't going to do the chosen frozen. Let's try this again. Good morning. Much better. Okay, this is what we're going to do. I feel the Holy Spirit so heavily in this room. And the good news is, where the Holy Spirit is, sickness has to leave. And it's going to leave right now in this room. It doesn't have an option. It's already been paid for. It already has to leave because it got paid for on the cross. We aren't going to beg God. He has even another secret. There there isn't even going to be a keyboard player. And people are going to get healed. Everybody stand up. Everybody. Okay. Put your hand on the person next to you. We aren't going to beg God to heal. God wants to heal more than we want to heal. He has another free secret. You have the authority in Jesus' name to heal the sick. You actually have the authority in his name to heal. You don't even have to believe an immense lot. Lazarus believed nothing when he was dead. Jesus raised him from the dead. Lazarus had no faith, I promise. He was dead. No faith, but he got healed. This is what we're going to do. I want you to say of the person next to you, I command complete healing to your body. I command all sickness to go. I command all pain to leave, and I release the healing presence of God through your body. Be healed now in Jesus' name. Okay, amen. Okay, if you had any pain in your body, I want you to test it out before you sit down. If you had pain in your ankle, if you had pain in your knee, give it a test if it's possible. Try it out. Okay, now raise both your hands if you feel a difference in your body. There's some, there's some, there's some. Anybody else? There in the middle. There in the front. Amazing. In the back there. Okay, you guys can be seated. Isn't that crazy how easy it is to heal the sick? Okay. Maybe not. We'll see. Hopefully it goes uphill from here because right now it's very quiet in this room. It's such a privilege to be here. I really love the Church of Truth family. I call it family because last time I was here, I I went to introduce myself to a gentleman on the front row, and I introduced myself, and he's like, bro, this is your second time here. You like family. (laughs) Okay. But even last time I was here, my dad, who's a pastor too and travels and speaks, he sends me a message, and he's like, I was in Belarus, and I walked up to a guy and I was like, introduced myself to the pastor and the pastor said he was from America. And so my dad said, where in America? And he's like, oh, from this city called Vancouver. And my dad goes, oh, my son's actually preaching at this church called Church of Truth in Vancouver. Have you heard of it? And your pastor says, that's my church. (laughs) And I was here preaching the same weekend my dad was in Belarus. Was it Belarus? Estonia. But isn't that cool how the family of God is just so small? I just want to honor Pastor. Thank you so much. I love what you're doing. I love what God's doing in your life. Pastor Serge and Pastor Roman. I love this church so much. And I actually felt during worship that God is saying that this church is coming into a new season. And I know that sounds like an awesome, like, prophets say new season all the time. I get it. But I really feel like you've been going through something. Or it might even be good, but God's saying, like in John 4, he says, Look up, the harvest is ripe. It's four months early, but it's ripe. And I believe that God's saying over this church, it's a new season, that the harvest is coming. Even if you don't expect it, get more chairs because the harvest is coming. And souls are coming in. Amen? Okay, let's get into the word quick. I'll start off with the Bible scripture. Acts chapter 8, verse 26. As always, pull out your iPhone. Keep your Samsung in your pocket. This is a holy place. Um... Acts chapter 8, I'm going to read out of the New King James Version. I just want to hit this quickly. Verse 26 of Acts chapter 8 says this. Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip saying, arise. Okay, we read that and we're like, oh, just an angel of the Lord. That's crazy. An angel shows up to Philip. That's nuts enough. The angel says this, arise and go towards the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. And we're like, oh, that's awesome. We've read this before. It's actually pretty crazy. Imagine God said to you, hey, champ, 
start walking towards Sacramento. We'd all be like, oh, God, I need more information. What am I doing in Sacramento? Right? We don't read the Bible like that, but it's actually crazy. Philip, just walk on the road. You'll be good. And it's desert. A random sentence. It just gets thrown in. By the way, it's desert. And the craziest part of the story is the next verse. So he rose and actually went. So now he's just walking down the road. We don't know how long for. It could have been hours. It could have been days. It could have even been weeks. He's just walking. God, I hope I heard your voice. Right? I hope I heard your voice. God, anything else? Anything else you want to tell me? Or do I just keep walking? This is desert. But he just keeps walking. And then what happens is he, he approaches a man who's under so much authority, he's over the treasury of a whole nation under the, the queen of Ethiopia. And the story goes on that through him encountering this, this, this man in a chariot, the whole of Ethiopia gets the gospel. So the premise I want to set for this morning before I speak is that your small yes can yield great results with God. Sometimes we're waiting for more information to obey what God's told us to do. God, you've said this, but you haven't told me how it's going to work out. Your small yes yields great results with God. He says, hey, champ, walk on the road. We're like, God, I'm not going until you give me my five-year plan. I want savings. What should I, put in my, what should I put in my bag, Jesus? Your small yes can yield great results with God. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you're here this morning. I thank you that you've done so much, God. I thank you that when we just say yes to you, when we just say yes to you, even if it's in a small way, you crash in, God. You come through us, and it's big results. God, we ask that with our lives, we would yield great results, Father, that you would move through us in such power. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I started thinking about this idea a few weeks ago. I was in South Africa, and I'd, I just preached at a church, and they were like, where do you want to go to eat? And I was torn between a steak restaurant and an Italian restaurant. It's a hard decision. It was the hardest decision I had to make in weeks. And I was like, I had, I had steak for lunch, so I'm thinking Italian. It wasn't a spiritual choice. So we go, and I get to the Italian restaurant, and I actually order lamb chops for some reason. I just felt like lamb chops. I get the lamb chops. I'm sitting down, I'm eating. I'm just loving life. And the waiter comes over, and I'm like, okay, I'm going to share the gospel with the waiter. So I'm like, hey, Jesus loves you so much. Do you need healing for anything in your body? Because everywhere I go, I'm telling people about Jesus, and I'm praying for them, and people get healed. It's crazy. It's amazing. And all of us can do that. So I'm like, do you need healing? She's like, well, I have a lot of weight in my back. My back's very heavy. So I'm like, okay, let me pray. She put my hand on the shoulder. In Jesus' name, be healed. I release healing. Test it out. She's like, the weight's gone. I'm like, that's awesome. Have a great night. And I go back to my lamb shop. She walks off. I'm walking out now. I've totally forgotten about the incident. She comes running after me, and I'm like, oh, what did I do, God, when I'm walking out the restaurant? She's like, hey. I'm like, hello. She gives me a big hug. So now I'm hugging the waitress. And she's like, you don't understand. I've been praying and fasting for a healing in my back. And now the pain's gone. The reason I share that is because a small yes for me was a huge result for her. Sometimes just the smallest things that we do can have the biggest results in other people. And that's what, that's what we read about there in Acts. We need to be okay with, with just doing the small things. Just being obedient to God and the small things. Because the results can be huge. And that's what I want to speak about today. If you're wondering where I'm from, my accent is from South Africa. My parents still live in South Africa. It's so funny. I want to tell you just a funny story just briefly. How many of you of the older generation struggle with social media? Anyone? Oh, a few people, okay. Well, you aren't even in the older generation. Put your hand down. My mom, her hand would be so high. My mom, one year, I'm just scrolling through Facebook, and I just see a post. Happy birthday, my boy, I love you so much. Not on my wall, just a status. Just a status. Not on anyone's wall, so I'm commenting, Mom, who are you trying to wish happy birthday to? She's like, oh, it was, it was one of my friend's birthdays. And then every time she wants to say something to me, she just writes it as a status. <laughs> just a status. No one knows who it's for. <laughs> hey, I love you so much. She has it all completely wrong. She, she sometimes puts up Insta stories on Instagram, just greeting me, but it's for everyone. <laughs> hey, hey, Dylan, love you so much. I'm like, Mom, you've... <laughs> You've got it all wrong. 
The reason I tell you that is I was reading John chapter 6 and it actually made me think about that story. So I'm going to explain what happens here in John chapter 6. I'm going to try my best to communicate it. You know when you've had such a good weekend at Portland, there's so much going on inside of you. You're like, God, just help me to slow down. Help me to communicate it. So this morning, I really believe that God has something for each one of you in this church. Even this week in Portland 2018, the Holy Spirit convicted me so much. And he was like, I just started crying during worship. I was like, God, I don't want to be a mouthpiece for what I have to say. I want to be a mouthpiece for you. And it really convicted me because I travel and speak a lot, but it's, you can so easily become a mouthpiece for what you want to say, for the agendas on your heart. And that's not necessarily wrong because it's still the word of God. But I was like, Holy Spirit, I want to really speak what you have to speak. I want to be a mouthpiece. And I believe this word is from God today. So if you have a Bible, you can turn to John chapter 6. And a little bit of background for where we're going to pick up in a second. We're going to start reading in verse 25. But a little bit of background. What's happened here is Jesus has this crazy miracle. Which if you've been in church or Sunday school or anything for any amount of time, this is like the first Sunday school lesson you hear about. He multiplies the loaves, right? It's like number one on the list of firsts in Sunday school. So it's this crazy story. Jesus gathers 5,000 men, just the men. There's even more kids and women. And he multiplies these, the loaves and the fish. And it's this crazy story. And thousands are fed. And there's fish and loaves left over. We all know the story. That night, Jesus goes up by himself onto a, onto a mountain. He begins to pray. While he's praying, the disciples are like, peace out. We're crossing the lake. So they start to cross the lake. Biblical scholars believe that where Jesus was praying on the side of the mountain, if you actually go to the location where he was praying on the side of the mountain, he could see the disciples on the lake. If you actually go there. What starts to happen is disciples are in the boat. The winds start to come. The storm comes. The waves get big. Jesus is watching them from the side. He has something free for you. No matter how close you get to God, the storms of life never stop coming. We believe this lie and even preach the lie on the street. Come to Jesus, all the storms will stop. Jesus never said that. He actually says, if you come to me, you'll have a rock in the midst of the storms. Well, that's encouraging, Jesus. The difference is that he is with them in the storm. So they start freaking out the storm. Jesus walks out to them because he comes to you in the midst of your storm. He doesn't calm the storm. Isn't that strange? Jesus could have just said, wind stop. But he walked to them in the storm instead. So no matter what you're going through, Jesus is with you. That's not what I'm speaking about. That's just for free. So, so he walks out to them, so they go to the other side. The next day, all these people that had the loaves before are like, where's Jesus? They, they rock up, they rock up to the side of the lake. One of the boats is gone. They're like, the disciples left without Jesus. How did he get to the other side? Where is he? They're so hungry for more of God. They're like, we're going to row to the other side. I don't know how many of you have rowed before, but it sucks. <laughs> After five minutes, I'm like, I'm out. He says, enough for me. They're so hungry for God, they start rowing to the other side of the lake. We would be like, wow, these people are so hungry for God, right? They've rowed all day in the heat to go and encounter Jesus for more of what he's done. <laughs> okay, let's read. This response that Jesus has makes me laugh so much. Our loving Jesus. Verse 25. When they found him, remember they've been traveling all day to find him. When they found him on the other side, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? So excited to finally find him. Jesus' response is actually a rebuke. He says, most assuredly I say to you, you seek me, not because of the signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. The word signs there is miracles. So what he's saying is this, you aren't coming to me for who I am, you're coming to me for what you got. And a lot of times we equate hungry people for coming to God, coming to church, going a long way. But the reality is Jesus, if you're coming to him for what you can get, you actually miss the point of the gospel. And these people miss the point because they say, they want the loaves, but Jesus wants love. Are you coming to God for loaves or for love? And so Jesus rebukes him and he says, and it goes on in verse 28. It's so powerful. And then they say to him, what shall we do that we, that we may work the works of God? And as that's up there, that we may work, that first work means to labor, to actually do an action, to work. The second work means business. So it's, it's what may we do? What may we labor that we may have the business of God? That's what they're asking. What actions can we do that we can have the business of God? And this is the response in verse 29. Jesus says this. This is the work of God. That word work means business. This is the business of God that you believe in him whom he sent. So often we come into God for the loaves that we can get, but God wants us to learn the family business. 
Are you coming to God for financial breakthrough or are you coming to God to learn how to walk and sustain financial breakthrough? It's not about coming to God for what you can get. And these people miss that and that's why they never actually, they just keep following God saying, can we have more loaves? And we call that hunger, God, I want more. God's like, you're missing, you're missing the point. You're coming to me for the loaves, but you're missing the bread of life. You're coming to me for what you can get, but you're actually missing the, the point of this whole thing. And we never hear about those people again. They just, they even say after that, they're like, show me another, show me another miracle. If you're looking for God to prove himself to you, he'll never prove himself. He'll always be looking for more. They've just had loaves multiplied the day before, and they're like, God, show us a sign that you are king. They don't actually get it. Now, I want to read a, a passage parallel to the scripture, and I'm going to read it out of John chapter 4. And I'm going to compare these two scriptures. And in John chapter 4, what happens is, again, we know the story. This woman is that it's the hottest time of the day. Jesus is traveling from Judea to Galilee, and he's walking. After six hours of walking, the Bible says that Jesus gets wearied, which is crazy. It shows that Jesus was 100% man, 100% God. He gets tired, and he sits at this well. Other times, multiple times in the Bible, Jesus has literally said to his disciples, do not go into the city of Samaria. At one point, he goes in, and no one even welcomes him into their house. So he stops on the outskirts of the city of Samaria in John chapter 4, and his disciples, as all teenage boys do, they go into the city to buy food. And he's just waiting at the well. And there's this woman, it's 12 o'clock noon, 12 o'clock noon, they're in the middle of the desert. Nobody's outside at 12 o'clock in the day. It's the hottest time of the day. Nobody's out. This woman starts to stroll up to the well. The fact that she's outside and nobody else it shows you that there's something going on in the story more than we can see. And we go on to find out later why she's at the well. is because she's had five husbands and she's with her sixth. And often people preach it like this. They say the reason why she's hiding is because she was a prostitute. But the reality is in Samaritan law, if she had cheated on five men, she would have been stoned and killed. So that shows you that it was that men that had cheated on her discarded her and she had become worthless in that city. That she was hiding from people. So you see this woman approaching who's so afraid of people that she's hiding in the hottest time of the day because nobody else is out. And she walks up to this well and there's a man there and straight away she's like, you a Jew. She just knows. Something about Jesus was very Jewish, of course. I don't know what it is, but she just knew straight away you a Jew. And we're going to pick up in verse 7. A woman of Samaria came to draw water, and she said to Jesus, Give me a drink, for his disciples are gone to the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask from me a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift, then who it is who says to you, Give me a drink? You would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. At this point, she has no idea of the gift of God that's in front of her. And... And it goes on that Jesus even offers her this living water. And she, she doesn't realize the gift that's in front of her. And Jesus offers her this living water. And when she's offered the living water, you have to understand that her thought process would have probably been, he would never offer me this if he knew who I was. Right? Why would somebody offer me something so good? He obviously has no idea who I am. And then this love encounter happens in the passage right here. And I believe this is what changes everything. She says, okay, give me this living water. And in verse 16 is where the love encounter happens. Jesus says, go and call your husband and come here. And suddenly she says, I have no husband. And he says, you're right, you've had five. And then it's hilarious. She tries to change the subject. You know when things get awkward? She's like, my ancestors used to worship on this mountain. It's like quick change. But this love encounter happens where Jesus is like, I offered you living water knowing that you sleep with five men and you're on your sixth. And that's where she realizes the free gift. And because she realizes the free gift, you're going to see what happens next. Is that she, it says, I want to read it because it's just so good. Verse 28, the woman then left her water pot and went into the city and said to the man, come see a man who told me all things. They went out and came to him. Listen, we're all waiting to be commissioned or told to evangelize. No one tells her to go into the city. No one says, you're an evangelist. No one says anything. She encounters the free gift of God and she goes into a city. The people she's hiding for come and meet Jesus. 
She's the exact people that are hiding. She is hiding from the middle of the day, are coming with her by the thousands to meet Jesus. By the thousands. No one says you're an evangelist. Suddenly all her insecurities fall away. The people she's hiding from is the people she's speaking to. And it's because she realized the free gift. She realized the living water. She got the living water. The other guys come to Jesus. They never realize that he is the bread of life. So they're still trying to get the bread of the world. That verse says she dropped the water bucket and she went and she preached to the city. Too many of us are carrying our water buckets around trying to tell people we have living water when we still have the things of this world. Imagine if she was walking with the bucket saying, I have living water, but she didn't. It's hard to tell people you have peace when you don't. She dropped the bucket and went and nobody commissioned her. No one said she's an evangelist. All she did was realize the free gift. In that moment, she realized the free gift. And you know this is true because when people get born again, they're so on fire to preach the gospel. Then what happens is we start camping at the well. Over time, we stop leaving the well. My encouragement today, the title of this message would be this, leave the well. Too many Christians are camped out at the well. We meet Jesus, it's the best moment of our life. We encounter his love, his peace, his joy. And then we start camping at the well. Jesus never says to go into Samaria and bring me the people. Nowhere in that story, Jesus even goes into Samaria. See, we've been waiting at the well saying, God, go into Samaria. Jesus never even goes into the city. He never even says, I want the city to meet me. Her hunger brings the city to God. It's time for us to stop saying, God, save our neighbor. God, save Portland. It's a good prayer, but he wants to use you. She doesn't stay at the well and say, Jesus, go to Samaria. She goes. She doesn't even ask. She's like, you have to meet this man. What length are we willing to go to to bring people into an encounter with Jesus? It's time to leave the well. Are we coming to Jesus to be fed or to be led? Are we coming to him for what we can get or how we can be led by him? She understands she has the living water. She doesn't need the things of this life anymore. The guys in John 6, they're all coming to be fed. Jesus wants us to be led. We need a transition. Leave the well. Stop coming to him to be fed. So often we're so focused on us, Jesus, I need healing. And Jesus heals you because he's merciful. But he wants you to learn the family business so you can go out and you can heal the sick. The reason why he encounters you at the well is so that you can go and touch people. But we've been waiting at the well saying, Jesus, go into my city. He's like, you go. It's time for us to leave the well. And it's so crazy. Because in verse 34, Jesus says, my will is to, my food is to do the will of the one who sent me. She realized that she didn't need the bread anymore. She didn't need the water anymore. She had living water. She realized she could be led by God. And then it's so crazy. Verse 35, do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes, look at the fields, they are white for harvest. Some scholars believe that when that's being said, Jesus is literally looking at his disciples and he's saying, guys, look up. You see that dust cloud of people coming to meet you? Do you see the thousands coming to meet you? The harvest is now. The harvest is ripe. See, I believe the harvest is more dependent on you going. We're waiting for revival. You have everything you need for revival. God is literally waiting on us to go. You can heal the sick. All you need to do is pray for the sick. It's hard to preach to some area when you're stuck at the well. God wants us to leave. He wants us to go out and make a difference. And my my challenge today is how many of us are willing to leave the well? And I know it's humbling sometimes because you might have been a Christian for years and you've just parked at the well, you've camped at the well, you've stayed there and you haven't made an impact. But it's time for us to leave the well because I'm serious about this thing. I'm not here to preach a good message. Vancouver doesn't get touched unless you go. Portland doesn't get touched unless you go. 5,000 people can gather at a well in Portland, but unless anybody goes, nothing's going to change. 5,000 people from all over America gathered this week to pray, prophesy, and declare how good God is, and it's important to meet Jesus at the well. But if Samaria doesn't meet that woman, they don't meet Jesus. He never goes into that city because it was her role. It's your role. It's my role. God wants to use us to encounter people. You are his mouthpiece. You are his hands and feet. You are his answer. Christ in you, the hope of glory, is God's answer to America. And 
I'm not saying you have to have a pulpit. I'm saying in work tomorrow, preach the gospel. In church, for too long, we've celebrated only people in ministry. We call people up and say, let's celebrate Joey. Joey's going to Bible school. What about John at the back who's going to medical school? Why are we not celebrating him the same way? See, the thing is, too many of us have excused. You hear testimonies from the amazing men of God on stage. Oh, God wouldn't use me. If there's anyone in that city God wouldn't use, it would have been that woman. An outcast. Doesn't want the people she's hiding from. She's hiding from men, but she brings thousands to meet Jesus. It's time to drop the excuses. She has every excuse of why God can't use her. But God uses her. What did she need? Bible school? No. It's good though. What did she need? All she had, which the people in John 6 didn't have, was she realized the free gift of God. When you realize the free gift, it's not evangelism, it's a lifestyle. When you realize it, I'm not talking about evangelism, I'm talking about being a Christian. Somewhere in the last 2018 years, we've added the second option to Christianity where it's a Christian soul winner and just a normal Christian. The second option was never supposed to be there. We aren't all evangelists, but every Christian is called to win souls. There's no other option. It's good news. She realizes the free gift, she goes and brings people to God. Too many of us have forgotten about the effects of the cross on our life. And when you, lose your, when you forget about the effects of the cross in your life, you lose your passion to tell people about Jesus. Some of us need to go back to the moment we met Jesus at the well. What was it like the first day you woke up free? What was it like the first day you woke up without sin, without addiction? Remember that feeling? We should live from that feeling. That should be the rest of your life. And never get better than righteousness. It really doesn't. The rest of your life, you're going to be amazed at righteousness. The fact you can be right with God, it never gets better than that. You could never get it, and now you have it. And it never gets more than that. You're like, I'm right with you, that's enough. And when you remember that place, then suddenly you want to share the gospel. Suddenly you want to preach. We thank you, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, I ask you to do in people's hearts only what you can do. Only you can give us the burden to preach the gospel. Only you can give us the burden for souls, Holy Spirit. We want to be your mouthpiece, God. Titus chapter 1 says that they, they profess God with their mouth. They denied Him with, with their works. God, we don't want to profess You with our mouth and deny You with our works, God. We want our works to back up what we believe, Father. For too long we've just said it's all faith. James 2 says faith without works is dead. It's nothing. Guys, America, Vancouver, Portland is looking for people that look like Jesus. They don't want to hear about what you believe. They want to see somebody that looks like Jesus. It's time for us to lay down our excuses. I'm not bold. I'm this. I'm that. I have a past. I don't have experience. I haven't done an evangelism class. All you need to do is realize the free gift that stands in front of you. All you need to do today is make a choice. Say, God, I'm tired of coming to you to be fed. What I mean by that statement is this. We come to God, for instance, to get financial breakthrough, and that's fine. Then once we get it, we go back to having nothing again. Then we say, God, you need financial breakthrough. He gives it to us. And we just keep getting fed. We never learn that when we have it, we need to give. And then we'll always have financial breakthrough. We miss the point. He's giving us financial breakthrough to learn how to steward it, to be led by His voice. But we're just focusing on how we can be fed. Or we come to Him for healing, and we don't realize the reason He's healing us is to show us that He's the healer so that you can heal the sick. We like the people in John 6, we come here for us. And he's saying, I want love. You want loaves. Come to God for love, not for loaves. I didn't come here to condemn or shame anyone, but I came here to challenge us, to inspire us, to say, let's leave the well. Let's see multitudes come to meet Jesus. Let's do it together. One woman leads thousands of men to Jesus. What can the hundred or two, three hundred of us do? A lot more than one. And all it takes is us saying, God, I'm going to leave the well. And this morning, I'm going to give us a chance to, if that's you, and please, please, I'm not doing it out of call to feel good. If one person comes forward, that's fine. But people that are serious about leaving the well, don't come forward if you aren't serious. It's fine if you stay in your seat, I promise. I'm not going to be offended. But I believe there's an invitation today for 
for a prophetic act of saying, I'm going to leave the wild, I'm going to leave my seat, I'm going to go forward. If this message is speaking to you and you know that you've been stuck at the well, you know that you've camped out there because it's safe, it's easy. You don't have to go and face the people that are judging you. Because for too long we've been like, oh, Christianity, it's just a little bit of salt and we slowly get into culture. That's not how the book of Acts worked. They were like, where are those people that are turning the world upside down? That's not slowly getting into culture, slowly into your workplace. Upside down. And God's looking for you to turn your workplace upside down. It's going to be messy. It's worth it. So if that's you today and you say that's speaking to me and, I'm, and you're serious about this thing. And you're like, I've camped at the well. If you're already preaching the gospel, you don't need to come forward. But if you're saying, I've camped at the well. I want to repent. I want to humbly say, I want to go again. I want you to just come forward. You don't have to. You don't have to come. If you want to come. Only if you're serious about this thing. wants to use you to touch the city. Christ in you is God's plan for the city. Your testimony is God's plan for the city. Testimony is the spirit of prophecy. What God's done in your life, He'll do in other lives. Your little yes, you just saying yes to God can yield huge results. He's just waiting for you to say yes. What is the small yes you've been ignoring? The small yes to maybe just speak to your coworker, to speak to your boss, to speak to your neighbor, because you're like, God, it, it doesn't all make sense. It doesn't have to make sense. Just say yes. Just say yes to the small things.